Hello students, uh, today we'll be doing the current affairs for the 20th of March uh, 2022. Okay, the first and uh, the most important topic that we'll be discussing is uh, the Indo-Japan affairs. This we'll be discussing in detail. Apart from this, we'll also discuss hypersonic missiles and the working of scramjets. Okay, okay. Now, apart from this, we'll also uh, read about pharma drug regulations in India. Pharma drugs are approved by the CDSCO, but the pharma drug prices are controlled by the NPPA. Please remember this, the National Pharma Pricing Authority. Also, we'll discuss a little about the Maharashtra governor who has refused to clear the election for Maharashtra speaker's post. So, we'll also discuss about the election of the speaker. Okay, and we'll also uh, touch the golden langurs and we'll discuss about the river interlinking project of India. So, the major topics that we'll discuss uh, today would be these. Okay, while the others are pretty static in nature. Moving on. The first topic. The Japanese Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, he had arrived in India for his first visit to the country as the head of the government. He met Prime Minister Narendra Modi for bilateral talks. India and Japan set an investment target of 5 trillion yen, which is about 42 billion dollars in the next 5 years. That's a huge number. The leaders announced after a meeting in New Delhi for the 14th annual summit. Please remember that India has annual summits with even Russia. So, annual summits are a thing that India has with Japan. It also has the same with Russia. Also, the two sides also exchanged six agreements on cyber security, economic partnerships, wastewater management, urban development, clean energy partnership, and an agreement on promoting bamboo-based products from northeastern region. Also, the 2 plus 2 meeting of the foreign and the defense ministers. India has the same arrangement with Australia. It has the same arrangement with even USA. We have a 2 plus 2 arrangement with both these countries along with Russia, uh, with, uh, along with Japan, I mean. The 2 plus 2 meeting of the foreign and the defense ministers in the next few months is due to take is due to take forward agreements on the strategic partnership. PM Modi is expected to visit Tokyo in May or June, where he will attend the Quad Summit with the US President and the Australian Prime Minister. You know that Quad is a grouping of similar and like-minded countries of India, Japan, Australia and the US. And they work for a rule-based order, they work for freedom of navigation, they work uh, against militarization of the seas, etc. Okay. Now we'll discuss in detail uh, Indo-Japan cooperation. Okay. Most of the points that are given over here are very straightforward points. Japan will be supplying India nuclear fuel, nuclear fuel and reactors. After India signed the 123 agreement, Japan was one of the countries which agreed to uh, export uranium to India. India is not a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty and hence only after India signed the 123 agreement with the USA and uh, when the IAEA agreed to it, only then could Japan export uranium to India. And India has received an exemption from Japan. Though Japan has been one of the biggest uh, you know, uh, countries which has been affected by these nuclear bombs the most, still Japan has gone ahead and supplied India with uranium fuel. So you can imagine the closeness of India's cooperation with uh, Japan. Also, not just that, India normally, it is very uh, apprehensive about letting countries into the northeastern region. Despite all of this, India has let Japan do a lot of infrastructural projects in the northeastern region. So this kind of shows the uh, depth of the cooperation that India and Japan have. Both the countries also have a rivalry with China. And to counter its behavior in the Indo-Pacific region, the two countries form the Quad, which includes USA and Japan, Australia, like what we spoke. Japan is the is only the second country after United States with which India is holding the 2 plus 2 dialogue. The India-Japan 2 plus 2 dialogue is an endorsement of the stra special strategic partnership between New Delhi and Tokyo. Okay. Even now with Australia, now India has uh, a 2 plus 2 dialogue. These are the strat strategic cooperation points. Apart from this, India and Japan have several military exercises. Okay. Like the Malabar exercise like the RIMPAC exercise, okay? Okay, apart from this, uh, Japan is also selling India 
uh, missiles uh, i mean they're selling amphibious uh, vessels uh, okay amphibious ve- vessels as in uh, amphibious vessels are those vessels which can operate both on land and in water these are known as the shinmaiwa shinmaiwa vessels which japan is selling india now uh, based on economic cooperation india and japan have signed a comprehensive economic cooperation partnership agreement this is a form of free trade agreement that came into force in 2011 and is the most comprehensive of all such agreements concluded by india japan has already invested in the 90 billion dollar delhi mumbai industrial corridor what is an industrial corridor okay an industrial corridor it helps in improving the logistical ease between these two cities it uh, industrial corridor it is nothing but a linking of roads in order to ensure that there is free movement of goods uh, and logistics across delhi and mumbai japan is the major investor in this dmic japanese fdi into india has mainly been in the automobile electrical equipment telecommunications and chemical and pharmaceutical sectors such as suzuki maruti suzuki it is nothing but a collaboration between suzuki and maruti india okay there is also cooperation in the railway sector as the mumbai ahmedabad high speed railway uh, this is nothing but the bullet train which was announced so this bullet train is going to work based on japanese technology okay japanese bullet trains are uh, very popular uh, which you already know so this particular uh, bullet train has been is being built with uh, japanese technology the ambitious project is being implemented with nearly 90% financial support and technology from japan the two countries have agreed to a bilateral swap agreement that would allow their central banks to exchange local currencies for up to 75 billion dollars in case there is a liquidity crisis or in case there is a dollar shortage india can borrow up to 75 billion dollars of uh, credit uh, from japan for indian rupees this is the meaning of a credit swap agreement this is substantially more than 30 billion dollar currency swap agreement announced between china and japan japan is the third largest source of fdi into india please remember this okay when it comes to space also there is a huge collaboration between the two countries okay both india and japan are seeking higher cooperation in critical sectors india japan space dialogue was announced by the prime minister uh, modi and japanese prime minister in 2018 at the end of the annual summit of both the countries they have their own systems for monitoring satellite images and ship movements in the oceans as the information is critical for national security as well as coastal security of both the countries okay uh, i am sure you must have heard of the information fusion center the indian ocean region which is set up in gurgaon okay now japan is a major uh, partner of this uh, entity and it also provides a lot of uh, information with regards to uh, national security and coastal security in terms of healthcare also ayushman bharat program which is nothing but uh, the national i mean ayushman bharat program which is nothing but offering 5 lakh rupees uh per family okay uh for at least about 10 crore families 10 crore families uh every year ayushman bharat provides about 5 lakh uh, rupees for medical facilities for 10 crore families in india so there is a synergy between ayushman bharat program and japan's ahwin program and both the sides have been consulting each other in order to identify projects in order to improve uh, ayushman bharat however there are also i mean the other uh, the other things which are there uh, for transforming the indo japanese relationship is the personal bro uh, personal relationship that the prime minister prime ministers of both the countries had like prime minister Mo- modi he had a personal rapport with uh, shinzo abe who was the previous uh, prime minister of japan also if you know that shinzo abe was uh, you know the first japanese prime minister to be the chief guest at the republic day parade in 
Okay. Now, moving on. Also, Japan is a major part in all of India's initiatives, such as the International Solar Alliance, okay, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. All these initiatives, Japan is a major part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then further, we also have an acquisition and cross-servicing agreement. Uh, this was a very recent ag agreement which was signed, which allows for logistic support, acquisition and cross-servicing agreement. It allows for logistics uh, benefit for Indian naval vessels or Indian submarines at Japanese ports and vice versa. Okay, now moving on. Now, what are the problems in the relationship? The trade dice, okay, even despite having a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, the trade dice have not been that great, okay, as compared to uh, Ch Japan's trade with China. Japan's trade with China is around $300 billion. While India's trade with Japan is just about $20 billion, okay? And even India's trade with China is about, you know, it's around $150 billion, $100-$150 billion. The bilateral trade between New Delhi and Tokyo stood at a meager $15 billion, while the Sino-Indian bilateral trade stood at $84 billion. I'm sorry, I started and corrected. It is more around $100 billion. In spite of the political tensions between India and China, the two sides have been unable to collaborate in the defense sector in spite of the huge potential. India is one of the biggest arms importers in the world, while Japan has been looking at arms exports. Despite that, you know, there has not been a proper collaboration in the defense sector. Also realize the synergy between India and Japan. While India has a growing working age population, Japan has a declining population. Okay. While India needs capital for investment and India needs technology, Japan has the capital for investment and Japan has the technology. And despite all of this, there is a mismatch. I mean, the, con the country's ties are not as good as what they should be. Both the countries have border and hegemonic issues with China. So their policy stance, it is dependent on China rather than dependent, being dependent on each other. Also, both of them have diverging interests when it comes to economic issues like e-commerce rules. India did not sign the Osaka track during the G20 meet in Japan. It opposed, uh, uh, you know, any e-commerce discussions. And, uh, and it uh, opposed uh, free flow of data. Okay. It said the data, critical data has to be stored within the country itself and there can't be any free flow of data is what India stood for. While Japan was saying that there needs to be more free flow of data for uh, better uh, inventions and for better uh, handling of data and for better, uh, uh, for more e-commerce and all of that. Okay. Also, uh, while Japan wants India to be part of the regional comprehensive economic partnership, India had not signed the RCEP for fear of Chinese goods flooding the Indian market. Also balancing between Quad and BRICS. India is a member of both Quad as well as BRICS. Okay, which brings together Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. In addition, though New Delhi has not joined the BRI, India is still a part of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. And in fact, India is one of the largest shareholders over here. The second largest, to be honest. Okay, so India has to do a balancing act between Quad and BRICS. Also, this Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, which was hyped a lot. Uh, it was signed in 2015. Was hyped a lot, but uh, there has not been any concrete achievement out of this Asian Asia Africa growth corridor. Pharma drug prices. Why is it in the news? Consumers may have to pay more money for medicines and medical devices if the National Pharma Pricing Authority allows a price hike of over 10% in the drugs and devices listed under the national list of essential medicines. The escalation which is expected to have an impact on nearly 800 drugs and devices is propelled by the rise in the wholesale price index. Okay, I think in one of the previous days, we discussed that the wholesale price index for the month of February had touched 13.01%, which is a very big number. Lobby groups, the pharma lobbying groups that represent the domestic pharmaceutical companies have been engaging with the central government to ask it to extend the 10% annual hike to scheduled formulations under price control okay i'm sure you know that as per the drug prices control order drugs can be classified into scheduled drugs and 
non schedule drugs all the medicines under national list of essential medicines are under price regulations okay as per the drugs drug prices control order scheduled drugs which are about 15% of the total pharma market are allowed an increase by the government as per the wholesale price index while the rest 85% of the drugs they are allowed an automatic increase of 10% every year okay no uh, most of the drugs that are found in the national list of essential medicines are found under the scheduled drugs component which is, which are about 15% of the total number of drugs which are found in the market okay now it is the national pharma pricing authority like what we discussed initially this is responsible for setting the prices of drugs the national pharma pricing authority was set up to fix revise prices of controlled bulk drugs and formulations and to enforce price and availability of the medicines in the country under the drug prices control order the ceiling prices of a scheduled drug okay most of these national list of essential medicines are under the scheduled drug category okay the ceiling prices of scheduled drugs is determined by first working out the simple average of price to retailer in respect of all branded and generic versions of that particular drug so all the branded drugs are taken all all the branded items of the drug are taken and all the generic uh, items of the drug are taken and an average is calculated okay i mean all the drugs which have a market share of more than 1% and after calculating the average around 16% a margin is added to it okay now whatever value comes out of it this is kept as the upper limit so no seller is supposed to sell beyond this price for scheduled drugs or for those drugs which are found in the national list of essential medicines okay and it is the uh nppa which sets this upper limit for scheduled drugs now the nppa is also mandated to collect maintain data on production exports and imports market share of individual companies profitability of companies for bulk drugs and formulations so not only should they ensure not only should they uh one second okay not only should they ensure the availability of medicines in the country and they should ensure that uh there are prices which are fixed appropriately for these drugs but they should also collect maintain data on production exports and imports and market share of all the different companies okay uh, so the nppa has a major role for the rest of the 85 drugs 85% of the drugs which are there in the market these drugs can actually have an automatic increase of 10% in their cost every year what is the nppa the nppa was set up as an independent regulator for pricing of drugs and to ensure availability and accessibility of medicines at affordable prices it is not a statutory or a constitutional body rather it is an attached body of the department of pharmaceuticals under the ministry of chemicals and fertilizers the functions of the nppa include fixation and revision of prices of scheduled drugs under drug prices control order issued from time to time as well as monitoring and enforcement of prices and ensuring the availability like what we had discussed okay mm. uh also please remember that apart from nppa there is also another body known as the uh, cd sco this is there for recognizing the different drugs recognizing drugs and only those drugs which are recognized by cdsco and which are approved by the cdso can be imported into the country or can be sold into the country okay now please remember that this national list of essential medicines which contains most of the scheduled drugs it is formulated based upon the world health organization's recommendations okay now this uh, uh this uh, nlem the national 
list of essential medicines it is modeled is modeled on who related who uh, suggested drugs okay and it is the ministry of health and family welfare which has prepared and released the first list of national list first list of essential medicines okay uh, as per uh, june 2018 the national list of essential medicines has around 850 drugs in it okay uh moving on the kinzel hypersonic missile russia said that it had unleashed hypersonic missiles against an arms depot in ukraine the first use of the next generation weapons in combat okay now russia's new kinzel hypersonic missile is a nuclear capable air launched ballistic missile that flies at 10 times the speed of sound and can overcome air defense systems okay please remember that hypersonic missiles are those which travel at either 5 times the speed of sound or more than that okay now uh the missile has a range of approximately 1500 to 2000 kilometers and can carry nuclear payload or conventional payload they are normally defined as fast low flying and highly maneuverable weapons designed to be too quick and agile for traditional missile defense systems to detect in time hence it is difficult for defense systems to kick in and stop these missiles unlike ballistic missiles hypersonic weapons don't follow a predetermined arc trajectory and can maneuver on the way to destination hence it becomes very difficult in order to stop them okay because they can be maneuvered they can be changed their uh, flight path can be changed even midway while ballistic missiles once they are find, fired it's very difficult to change their flight path like what we had discussed hypersonic uh, missiles they have a speed which is faster than 5 times of the speed of sound okay at hypersonic speeds the air molecules around the flight vehicle they start to change and they break apart gaining a charge in the process which is known as ionization the air molecules around the missile they get ionized the subjects the hypersonic vessel to tremendous stresses as it pushes through the atmosphere and this is the reason for the boom okay now there are two main types of these weapons which are glide vehicles and cruise missiles these are the two types analysts say that russia is leading the hypersonic race followed by china and the us okay now supersonic missiles are those which travel at around 2 to 3 times the speed of sound okay now moving on now uh, also please remember that hypersonic uh, missiles they usually use this technology known as scramjet technology scramjet technology okay in a normal uh, missile which employs turbojet you have an internal motor for compressing the air and for combustion uh, and this ensures combustion okay whereas in the case of scramjet in the case of scramjet or in the case of a ramjet okay both of these are a form of air breathing jet engine that uses the vehicle's forward motion this vehicle's forward motion is used in order to compress the air that flows in they don't have any particular component to do the compressing like how in the turbojet it is compressed by a specific component by the motor however in the case of scramjet and ramjet the forward movement of the missile itself or the forward movement of the body itself causes uh causes compression of the incoming air uh and this compressed air can be combusted okay hence there is no need of a rotating co- uh, compressor like how over here there is a compressor that is needed over here there is no compressor that is needed automatically it's uh, compressed and combustion can happen okay uh while ramjets actually work at work best around max speed of 3 okay it scramjets work at 
work best at hypersonic speeds so ramjets are better for super spo- supersonic uh, machines while scramjets are better for hypersonic uh, ve- vehicles maharashtra governor refuses to clear the election for speaker's post we had spoken about this just now the maharashtra assembly speaker's position has been lying vacant for more than 1 year and if the governor has his way it is likely to stay vacant for some more time okay now who is the speaker the speaker is the final interpreter of the provisions of the constitution of india the rules of procedure and the conduct of business of the lok sabha and the parliamentary proceedings within the house so whatever the speaker says within the house that is final that is how the law has to be followed within the house okay whereas it is the speaker who presides over the joint sitting of the two houses of the parliament and over here the order of procedure of the lok sabha is followed the speaker can adjourn the house or suspend the meeting in the absence of 1/10 of the members of the house which is known as the quorum he also has the casting vote while the speaker does not vote initially he does not vote at the first instance but rather if at all there is a tie then it is the speaker who votes money bill a bill is certified as a money bill when it is approved by the speaker okay when it comes to disqualifying members it is the speaker who decides on the disqualification of member of the lok sabha even under the 10th schedule speaker acts as the ex officio chairperson of the indian parliamentary group apart from this he also acts as the chairperson of the business advisory group business advisory committee i mean okay the general purpose committee and then the rules committee the committees of the house are constituted by the speaker and and they function under the speaker's overall direction the speaker is the guardian of the rights and privileges of the house its committees and the members apart from this please know that the election of a speaker uh, happens according to one second uh, the election for the election of a speaker he has to get the majority of all the members who are present i mean who are elected to the lok sabha so he has to get a majority of all the members who are elected to the lok sabha which means that he has to get half of the 538 members okay this is compulsory and also the constitution the indian constitution it requires that the speaker has to be a member of the lok sabha or uh, whichever house once again lok sabha uh, while in the case of the rajya sabha uh, the chairman he is uh, the vice president of india is the ex officio chairperson of the rajya sabha while in the case of the lok sabha the speaker has to be a member of the lok sabha okay now it is said that once a speaker always a speaker it is believed that the speaker has to act with non partis he has to act in a non partisan manner okay now the speaker is normally elected for a term period of around 5 years he holds office from the date of his or her election till immediately before the first meeting of the next lok sabha okay so even after the lok sabha is dissolved the speaker does not lose his post he remains a speaker until the next lok sabha is convened okay until the next lok sabha is reconstituted okay next moving on study reveals major decline in golden langur habitat okay what is the golden langur it is a old world monkey it is one of the oldest monkeys out there and its habitat is restricted to the region surrounded by the four geographical landmarks the foothills of bhutan in the north manas river in the east sankosh river in the west bhutan manas sankosh and brahmaputra in the south and it is endangered status under iucn a study 
by scientists recently has suggested a significant decline in the habitat of the golden langur an endangered primate species distributed in the transboundary region of bhutan and india a recent paper titled uh, future simulated landscape predicts habitat loss for golden langur a range level analysis for an endangered primate throws light on whether the habitat of the endangered primate is protected or not in india fragmented and isolated populations of golden langur are distributed in uh, regions of assam okay the results indicate that out of the total range extent of the golden langur currently only 12000 square kilometers is suitable for the species at present which will further be reduced to 8000 square kilometers by 2031 only 14% of the future suitable areas fall under the protected area network of india and bhutan in recent years studies from these areas have reported human langur conflict cases and the intensity of these cases is only increasing earlier in the 1990s the extraction of timber by extremist groups in the region had resulted in the destruction of forest patches in southern assam this has resulted in a fragmentation of landscape and fragmented landscape affects the population of uh, langurs over there while recent community conservation programs by the government yielded positive results for the golden langur population of manas national park fragmented and isolated populations are still severely threatened and when populations are fragmented what happens is that there is inbreeding and because inbreeding happens they develop a lot of uh, diseases and they have lesser resistance towards uh, diseases or viruses etc okay and that often makes them extinct more on the golden langur golden langurs can be easily recognized by their color which is often golden it has been noted that their fur changes colors according to seasons as well as the geography that is present okay the color also differs from adults and youngst young uh, ones of the same species in that uh, the young ones are pure white okay the they are highly dependent on trees and they live in the upper canopy of forests their habitat is restricted to what we just spoke of earlier they are endangered amongst the iucn uh, list they are endangered okay according to the sites list they fall under the appendix 1 and under the wildlife protection act they fall within the schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act what are the other threats apart from fragmentation you know apart from people hunting them and apart from inbreeding the other threats are restrict human animal conflict the other ones are restricted habitat as mentioned above their habitat is restricted by national boundaries further increasing the threat of extinction uh, habitat fragmentation we spoke of their habitat in assam has fragmented drastically especially after a thrust on rural electrification and massive deforestation obstruction such as wires and gaps in the forest due to felling have increased the threat of inbreeding amongst golden langurs okay next uh, lesson or uh, next topic parthapi narmada river interlinking project uh, the reason why this river interlinking is in use is because the tribals in gujarat will be holding a public meeting to protest against the centers parthapi narmada river linking the parthapi narmada linking project was envisioned under the national perspective plan under uh, you know the former ministry of irrigation and also it was recommended by the central water commission okay this uh, uh, this national perspective plan basically this national perspective plan it was earlier known as national perspective plan it is currently known as the national river linking project and it envisages the transfer of water from surplus uh, basins where there is flooding to water deficit basins where there is drought scarcity through inter basin water transfer okay now uh, this par tapi narmada project what does it do it proposes to transfer water from surplus regions of the western ghats to the deficit regions of saurashtra and kutch these are the drought prone regions in gujarat okay the excess water in the interlinked par tapi and narmada rivers which flow into the sea in the monsoon would be diverted to saurashtra and kutch it proposes to link three rivers par which originates from nasik tapi which originates from satpura in madhya pradesh 
and it later flows through maharashtra and gujarat okay and narmada which originates from madhya pradesh and flows through maharashtra and baruch and uh, in narmada districts in gujarat and finally it meets the arabian sea over there okay now we spoke about the uh, national river linking project okay there is a, there are also several other projects uh, you must have heard of them uh, yeah we have the daman ganga and pinjal project which is also another very popular river interlinking project and we also have the kane betwa linking project okay these are also the other famous uh, river linking projects okay what is the narmada river basics of it it is the largest west flowing river of the peninsula region and it flows through a rift valley between the vindhya range in the north and satpura range on the south basically you have the vindhyas on the north and you have the satpuras and between these you have a rift through which the narmada flows it rises from the maikala range near amarkantak in the madhya pradesh and it drains a large area in madhya pradesh besides some area in maharashtra and gujarat so ideally narmada it has uh, basins in all these three states the river near jabalpur it forms the duandar falls these are major waterfalls there are several islands in the estuary of narmada of which the alia bet is the largest the tributaries of the narmada river are hiran orsang the barna the kolar etc okay also the major hydropower projects are indra sagar sardar sarovar etc now what is the tapi river another important west flowing river which originates from madhya pradesh is tapi and it originates in the satpura range it also flows in a rift valley parallel to the narmada but is much shorter and its basin covers parts of madhya pradesh gujarat maharashtra and i also believe that it covers a little bit of rajasthan uh, uh though we need to check it once uh please do check if please do check the course of the tapi river now what is the par river the par river is a river in gujarat with its source near nashik in maharashtra it flows into the arabian sea so you have both maharashtra as well as gujarat over here which form a base which form the basin of the par river okay thank you